Good day, everyone. So last week we talked about how long your resume should be. I've highlighted the importance of hitting the right balance between providing enough information about yourself, yet not overwhelming the reader to ultimate boredom. I do suggest you watch my videos in order. It will make far more sense that way. All right, so today we'll talk about the next two very sensitive aspects of a good resume, content and organization. As you've probably noticed, I'm going in a top to bottom approach with these episodes. We'll first talk about a really broad topic of size, and now we're going to be breaking it down into more detailed components. First, let's talk about content. Since before you organize your resume, you do need to understand what are you going to be organizing after all. For an IT professional, or anyone for that matter, there is one core element of a resume and a few supporting sections. Now, the core element is easy to guess. It's your related employment experience. Where have you worked? What have you done? And how many years have you been doing it? Now, supporting sections vary, but from personal experience, I would highlight two very important sections. Key summary of your strengths in freeform sentences and an education section, including a list of certifications completed, if you have any. Anything else is really much less relevant. Your profile summary is your elevator pitch. This is a key section bound to grasp attention of a hiring manager who is skimming through a multitude of candidates. It should catch their eye, make them pause and want to read through the rest of your resume. It should contain your job title, whether present or desired, as the header, followed by highlights of your expertise in a few easily readable sentences. Don't overextend. This section should be brief and straight to the point. A longer paragraph would diminish the impact and purpose of this intentionally brief summary. Intuitively, this should come at the very top of your resume. Employment history comes second. It's a core part of your resume, the meat of your application. So important, in fact, that it actually requires its own episode to go through in detail. But organizationally, it should come right after profile summary. As a manager, if I see a characteristic that excites me, I would instantly want to shift to a more detailed description. And where else would I find it other than in the employment history section itself? Finally, your resume should end with a brief section about your education and formal achievements like certifications. A number of managers like myself will look here to get a better understanding of your technological background. Did your degree come from a school in the United States? or was it from another country? Was it from a highly praised school like Princeton or MIT, or was it from no-name state college? Was it even in an IT-related field? This section tells managers a lot about you in a very specific way. Think about it. As a manager, you could be easily misled by a candidate's employment description. For example, a resume could state a big-name employer and a groundbreaking project, but an applicant could simply be doing automation scripting a far less challenging and intellectual work than it would appear. Getting a degree from a reputable university is a whole different story. With few exceptions, you can be confident that the candidate does know their stuff. Same goes for certifications. As generic as they are, they do guarantee a certain minimal skill set. Some tests are easier, some tests are harder. But they do let a manager get a better understanding of how advanced the individual is. Yet neither education nor certifications will get you hired but they will definitely help you get selected for further consideration. Lastly, do include your contact information, name, phone number, and email at the top of the resume. Make sure to put your LinkedIn profile as well if you have one. And really, in today's day and age, you should have one already. One more thing I wanted to talk about. I often get asked whether a references section needs to be included on the resume. My answer is, don't bother. At this stage in the process, it's mostly clutter. No one is going to call references before speaking with the candidate themselves. In fact, that will most likely happen after you pass the interview and the manager is considering to make you an offer. A stage at which a resume itself is no longer relevant. It's common sense and expected that your references will provide positive feedback about you. So the only true value is to get a sense of whether you are who you say you are and potentially ask some behavioral questions about you to someone who has worked with you before. So, in my honest opinion, the references section should be skipped altogether as it doesn't really add value. Unless your references are Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg. But, you know what, in that case, ignore what I just said about organization altogether. Slap that references section right at the very top 
and use Big Rod Thumb while you're at it. This wraps up the topic for today. But before I bid you farewell, I would like to kick off the candidate tear down segment where I will discuss resumes that I come across myself or the ones that you sent to me for thorough review. And today we have one such application, which is a prime example of the bad practice we talked about last week. It's extremely long. What I'm holding in my hand and what you see on the screen are six pages of a resume that I've received for consideration to a .NET position that I have been trying to fill recently. So right off the bat, you can note that the first page is really loaded. Um, it starts off nicely with a brief profile su summary, but the rest of the page is dedicated to listing various technologies in a bulleted list form. It's easy to spot and as a manager I will most often skip the section entirely as it doesn't add any value to me understanding this candidate. Page 2 is dedicated to a single place of employment. Now in this case you would probably imagine this to be a decade-long tenure that truly requires a whole page to describe all of the achievements. But if we check the date, we see that this person only spent less than a year in this position. Not surprisingly, I'm reluctant to read through page two as well. In fact, at this point, a decision is pretty much formed in my head. But looking through the rest of the resume and checking the dates, we'll see that for the most part, this person spent less than a year at any single place of employment. And this is a really big red flag for any employer. So in this case, the verdict is a most confident rejection. All right, so hopefully today's episode gave you a better sense about how to organize and structure a resume. And now that I do have your interest, in the next video I'll talk more about my own managerial style and what I look for in candidates when I build engineering teams. This will also help set contextual reference to how and why I believe certain things about the hiring process. So hold your breath and I will see you again next Tuesday. Make sure to show your support Hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't, and leave your comments in the discussion section. Also, do send me your resumes to be potentially featured in the candidate teardown segment. And remember, if you find this content helpful, most likely it's also helpful to your friends and colleagues. So spread the joy by sharing it with them. Until next time.